still have some visuals. Um, we'd like to talk about Jizura, uh, which is a small uh, graphics uh, framework done mainly by Dan Emelin. It's his PhD thesis. Um, and a couple of other people at Viewpoint Research also contributed. And they forced it, uh, the Ometa implementation of course, and Shiki, and I contributed a little bit. Uh, I worked on the small talk part, so that's why I'm uh, uh, in, in italics there. <laughs> Slanted it. Um, so, um, what you see here on, on the screen. That's actually everything is rendered using Jizura itself. Um, and so I'm using our Frank documentation, uh, Frank document editor system. Um, and this is just one of the little features which demonstrates the text layout. Uh, so that's object oriented. Every little character on the screen is a separate object. And as you can see, the layout is implemented by just having each glyph go to the right of its predecessor, and if, if it goes uh, over the right margin, over there, then it tells the first glyph in the, in the word to go to the next line. That's, that's how it works. Um, and when I disable the animation, then that's just an instantaneous. Um, So, um, please feel free to ask uh, questions at any time. Uh, otherwise, I will just proceed here. Oops. Okay. I got to start the scripting for advancing. All right. Yeah, there we go. Um, so, Jizura is a small graphics library. Um, and the point is uh, to find the, the, the minimal um, expression of doing graphics um, that is uh, about as uh, powerful as Cairo, which we just heard before. Uh, that's also where the name comes from. Jazeera is actually an island in Cairo. Uh, that's where it is. So, Cairo is the uh, capital of Egypt, and uh, that little island in the, on the Nile, that's Jezerno, and that's, uh, that's the name. Um, it's implemented in Nile, which is a stream-based language that Emeline invented for, for doing this. Um, then we have an Omega-based translator that translates that to either C code or small code. Um, and what you see running here now is that the C code uh, has a binding um, to, into a script plugin and that's rendering uh, all those bits and then um, there's still a bit blit involved uh, to get the actual bits onto the screen and then from the screen to the operating system so it's not really optimal uh, but our point is to, to make it really uh, nice and small um, and or you can use the small talk uh, code for debugging that stuff. Um, now itself um, is, is a very simple language in a way. Uh, it's made of independent kernels that can have arguments and that are connected by streams. So every kernel has an input stream and an output stream. Um, and let me show you, well, maybe just a, an example over here. Oh, yeah. So if you really want to know more about Nile itself, um, then you should wait for the PhD thesis to be published. Uh, there's a paper and a slide presentation I don't know, Dan and Lang out there. Uh, but he made this, and basically the state of the art is code that looks like this um, in Cairo or uh, Chrome. And there's ten thousands of lines of this. Um, whereas this is the um, Jizura source code written in Nile. Um, and this is actually the full renderer. So uh, the basic idea of Jizura is um, that you only have a single graphics primitive, which is a quadratic Bezier curve. And 
then Dan came up um, with a little mathematical expression that calculates the contribution of that single base V curve to one pixel. And everything else is just uh, building up from there. So the actual, um, can you see the most pointer? Not really. So uh, I'll show it here. Um, so what happens is that you feed Bezier's into the pipeline, which are like this long maybe. Um, then they get broken down into single pixel chunks. This is here. And so decomposed Bezier's gets into it Bezier's and or puts out edge samples. Uh, this is the de Casoliot algorithm, uh, which is the midpoint subdivision uh, down into uh, the um, until the the length is only inside a single pixel. Um, so it's using this little syntax here, uh, which is a wiggly line. Uh, it's actually defined over here, so that's the operator. Wiggly line means a plus b divided by two, just the average of two uh, numbers. Um, so either it's inside the, uh, the pixel, then it does this little thing, or it subdivides and puts those two Bezier's back into the input stream. Or it generates uh, the coverage, it covers the coverage, and puts that coverage into the output stream. Um, and so each of these, what, what looks like a function def definition, is a kernel. Like this is a little bit longer here. Um, and they are chained using streams. So every kernel has an input stream and an output stream. It reads stuff from the input, writes to the output, and that's it. Um, okay, let's switch back here. So, apart from generating these pixels, Bert, when you start with something like that, how do you work with it? How do you debug it? What are the tools? Um, I'll come to that. Um, but I, so the, the current version is the you know, six or seven iteration of the of the thing. So the, the history was that then looked for this mathematical formula and then tried to find a way how to express it. So the first version was just written in C. It was a huge chunk of C code. Uh, it was slow. Uh, it wasn't really kernel based yet. Um, then you try to find the a nice version. Uh, that runs fast enough in C, and then he thought up of a language that could describe those semantics, and then uh, that language generates the C card. Um, but I'll, I'll show you something. Um, so, transforms and shading and compositing and uh, gradients and all that is also expressed in, in that little language. Uh, that's not on this slide, so it's about one page of code like this for all the compositing modes that uh, PDF and Photoshop uh, uh, can uh, use as there is uh, uh, some crazy easy modes like Lighten and uh, the regular over, uh, well, that's what you usually use and there are uh, highlights and shadows and uh, I don't know, all these blending modes. Some are more complicated, some less, but in Nile every kernel is not more than five lines. Uh, and then there's another page of code for stroking, that's the outlining um, with uh, rounded corners or with uh, bevel corners or miter corners and all that. Um, so let's see. Oh, yeah. um, so we made a couple um, of exploration tools and uh, this is a little interactive tool for explaining how the you know, user pipelines work. So the basic rendering pipeline is that it is a transform kernel that has a parameter which is the transformation matrix, just six real numbers, uh, then it gets clipped to the, to a rectangle uh, that gets rasterized and the texture gets applied and then the, it's written into an image. Um, and so we have this little um, pipeline here um, so there's a funnel where you can pipe geometry into it. Geometry is just um, that star there, so it's a, uh, it's a shape made from 10 Bezier curves. 
it doesn't really look curvy, but if you double a control point in the Bezier curve, then you just get a straight line. Um, so that's the 10 uh, Bezier curves, then they are transformed, uh, clipped, rasterized, then there's a uniform color applied, and it's written into this output image here. And I can just uh, click here, um, and that's what it does. Um, so apparently the transform isn't quite right. Yeah, so the transform that's going on, um, the, the geometry is actually centered <coughs> on the top left. Um, like here's the center of the star, and then it's translated by 50 pixels in the y direction to make it go more to the right. I would have to say, say 50 pixels here. And try again. Yeah, maybe 100. Oops. And also, it didn't erase anything because we didn't specify that. Yeah. So that's at least centered now. Um, to erase, uh, we would have to construct another pipeline uh, that just fills the background with blue. And I'm going to do that. I have a funnel over here. Um, I'm going to clip those Bezier's, uh, rasterize the light detection, then write into an image. And then we need some parameters. So we get the geometry from this object, which is a rectangle for Bezier's. Um, then we're going to clip to 0, 0, 200, 200. It looks OK. Um, we'll have a uniform color. Uh, let's make it, I don't know, green. And then it's going to write to this image. And so I'll execute this pipeline. And there we go. Um, so this is using the small talk code right now uh, because I can actually edit the kernels that are behind these tiles here. So that's why it takes, takes a while. Um, so now it's green, and now we can run this again. It should put the star on top of it. And then um, maybe we want to have a, a compositing going on. So instead of this uniform color here, uh, we want to paint the star with a compositing, <coughs> uh, with some compositing in it. Um, so I should change the transform again so it's not on the same uh, spot. Let's say 100, 100. And then we're going to composite um, oops. let's say blue, some blue with alpha. So it's half transparent. And so this composite texture is a kernel that takes that takes two input textures. So one is the uniform color, the other is the read image, um, and then over is the compositing mode. It's another kernel that does the actual uh, compositing. So the uniform color, uh, we said that already. Uh, it's reading from the background image. So 
uh, you can say the partnership fire and the fire stand still. Stack, stack is the, the whole stack of cards here. It's modeled on, on uh, HyperCard. Um, next page. Accept. Okay. Click here. Yeah, that's the next slide. All right. <laughs> Um, so this is a picture of the Jazeera Island again, and uh, I like that because of the traffic jam down there in the pipeline. Um, so that happens in the run around too. Um, so here's a little uh, code, um, and when I execute this, so we have a, one texture that's a gradient uh, defined from, so we have alpha, R, G, and E, red, green, and blue. So it's a gradient from red to yellow, um, and the alpha value varies from 0 0.7 to, uh, oh no, that's it. This is actually the, the delta, okay. So that's the original color and that's the delta. So uh, the, the green gets interpolated from 0 to 1. And that's why it's getting yellow at the, at the outside. Um, it's a radial shape, and we have a compositor. And this is my main, um, my main kernel. That, that, so it's defining the, the whole rendering loop, uh, the whole rendering pipeline. This little double arrow means um, replace this kernel with this pipeline um, in the, that, that's following. Um, so it's going to transform the Bezier's, it's rasterizing them, it's applying a texture, it's writing, um, and I can change the number here. So if I just change the transformation and execute it again, then um, yeah, it's going to get narrower. And there's a script running doing uh, this behind that execute button that fills the background in before, so that's why I don't have to specify it as an example. Um, and I can go in here and uh, change the compositing mode. Uh, some of you saw me doing that yesterday. Um, so if I ignore the background color by multiplying the zero, zero, then there's no compositing going on anymore, of course. Uh, I can just add these two um, values and I can ignore the, uh, the incoming color, the gradient, uh, and instead just multiply the background by three. Um, this. And so you see, I'm carefully avoiding to delete that cross character because I cannot type it. <laughs> Not yet, anyway. So we'll, we'll get to that. Um, still no questions. Am I too quick, too slow, to Alright. Um, okay, it's another slide I didn't uh, do the next button. Uh, there's still another way. What's on the next slide? Ah, alright. So, maybe I should uh, do a little bit uh, more interesting. <laughs> So I get out of my full screen mode. Uh, so this this whole thing is running in Squeak inside a morphing window. Um, our long term goal is to to replace Squeak with something more interesting. But um, right now the tools are in small are just so convenient that we haven't really find uh, haven't really found anything else. Um, so the spirit of the old small talks where Smalltalk 72 was used to create Smalltalk 74. Um, we're kind of uh, trying to find, to, to build that new system inside the old system until there's a convenient way to switch over. We haven't reached that yet. Uh, but if you're following the, the funk list, for example, or the publications that Viewpoints Research does, um, you'll see that there's a steady series of uh, experiments we are doing towards a newer uh, different computing system. Um, so I just said the, the translation is slow. Um, 
But I, yeah, so I can maybe just show you a little bit. Um, so when I, where's my, okay, actually I can, I can show you the, the actual thing that was happening here. So I'm going to open my tools. So that's the explorer on that object, and there's a jitter environment. Oops, lost my head. Yeah, here we are. And that's where the where the magic happens. Um, so when I accept this this uh, source code here, oops, that's my source code. Uh, then it gets parsed into separate definitions. And so these are all the definitions. There are some definitions that are the built-in kernels. Um, and then down here, oops, down here, there are my own kernels. Yeah, so that's the micro kernel, micron kernel, main kernel. Uh, but I can use all those definitions uh, that are already in there. Um, and when I do this, um, what the compiler does, it creates a little dictionary which has three classes in it. So there's main, which is a GC main 3 for 1 class, and uh, icon is, is another class, and this is another class. And these are classes that are not in the, in the regular small part hierarchy. So it's an anonymous class. <coughs> it's not in the, there's a parent class, called GC kernel, um, and in, in that class has a subclasses array, but these classes are not in there. But the class has a pointer back to that superclass. So when I close this window, all these classes get couch collected. Um, or when I create a new, when I create it, uh, yeah. So I'm mumbling, sorry. Um, so, these are two methods that were generated, and maybe the process method is interesting. So I can just uh, get at the source code of that. And this is the, the process method for the MyCon kernel, uh, which used to do the B times 3. And as you can see, that's the whole thing that's going on. So while there is still input, read eight numbers from the input stream, um, multiply each by three, and output four numbers to the output stream. That's it. And um, this basically uh, looks similar in the C version, um, except that you can imagine um, this runs for um, yeah, this creates huge intermediate streams, right? When I render a full screen um, star, uh, for example, then it will create a point for each of these, um, for all the pixels in that star, it will just be a huge stream. And here in Swarm, I don't really care about it, because for once we are only doing a small image. Um, and uh, secondly, um, we are not really using this for interactivity, um, but in the C version, what happens is that it reads only a chunk, um, like a hundred numbers, a buffer full of uh, numbers, processes those, puts them into the output stream, and then the runtime can switch to a different kernel um, that has something in its input buffer already. So that way, uh, we never have huge amounts of temporary data, but it's just flowing through the pipeline. And, i come to that later, uh, because those kernels are independent of each other, they can be run in parallel. Um, yeah. So, um, recombining only the change kernels, that is one little trick uh, I put in there, so what's, what's happening is that the source code gets parsed but not translated yet. And then I have the definition of those um, kernels as a string. Then I just compare the strings. If they change, it gets recompiled. If not, 
but it's not good for your now. So that's a, a trick someone might use um, because the, this modern compiler, if you are editing methods, it's also kind of slow, uh, at least the one in Squeak. Um, so because you're always only editing a single method, it doesn't really matter. But if you were to parse a whole file, yeah, finding in something takes a lot of time. And if you were to uh, to use some format that has um, that defines many methods, but you only want to change one, then this trick could could help. Uh, so you find out which of the methods change, and you would only remove one. Method. Anyway, that's unrelated. Um, what else do we have here? Oh yes, small talk code generation is fun in Squeak because Squeak still uses basically the original small talk 80 bytecode set. And it's only made for handwritten methods. So there are various limitations in there. We have two frame sizes in the VM, and the large frame can have uh, 64 um, words in it. And so the maximum number of temporal variables you can use if you don't have any arguments, it's 52. So the, the rest of the arguments is uh, something else on the frame, and it's an instruction pointer and uh, all that uh, stuff. Um, this is kind of limiting, um, because some of the generated kernels have hundreds of temporary variables, just because of the way the code generator is written. And because the code generator was written for a C compiler first, and C compilers do not have this limitation, um, I ran into this very quickly. So one is that the temporal variables are limited, and the other is that because of the main loop in, uh, that you just saw, so in at, uh, in at end while falls you this body, uh, what happens in the bytecode is that you have, you have a jump from the far end back to the top, and the longest distance you can jump in speed is 10 to 24 bytes. So you can only have 1k of bytecodes. That's by far not enough uh, for uh, these uh, simulated things. So um, what the code generator does, and that might be interesting, um, is so these are all generated kernels. Um, you apply a texture kernel for example. That's kind of simple um, because this only creates a new pipeline. Uh, maybe you should show the, the corresponding source code for that, uh, which is in texture. Alright, 
it creates good assembly code maybe, then you could just change the, the translator and have that generated code and the semantics wouldn't change. So that's the that's one of the ideas behind that whole invent a new language thing and um, do it. So I, I don't really know of of, uh, of any other uh, yeah, system in use that, that has that approach. So Cairo is just handwritten code all over. Um, Apple's Parts Composer actually has a similar DSL, mm -hmm. but this kind of thing. Yeah. Um, but they kind of put all the developing it just as they got the competent compilers for them. So I see. it's it's uh, mm -hmm. interesting. Yeah. Good. So where were we? Um, anything more? Yeah. I can. If you want, I can debug into this and um, show you what's happening. Uh, but let's see what other slides I have. Okay. Oh, the simulated returns, I didn't uh, mention that. Uh, so, so one of the issue is that you want to preserve the semantics of return, uh, which means abort here. And But what if that return is not in the main process method, but in the yeah, somewhere uh, down there. Um, so, so these are all the process methods. Um, let me see where it's called. Process two. So this is the like the main function that is called. Uh, no, this is used for every uh, kernel. Um, depending on if I have a downstream kernel. So the kernels are all chained, they're pipelines, so they are linked list downstream points to the next kernel. So if I have a downstream kernel, I uh, use as output buffer the two, uh, no, if I don't have a downstream kernel, I use the two uh, stream as output, otherwise I just create a temporary output. Then the process method is what every class overrides, and then, if the answer is process switch, um, then do this or that. Um, and so, let's see. Yeah. So, for example, here, this process wants to do a return process switch. So, uh, this one here does a process switch, returns process switch, and this awards the computation of the kernel. Um, and this is just a return. But if this is nested inside the process one method, then it needs to emulate that process switch. And the way I'm doing that is I'm implementing that method return process switch from the process method that just called me. And that's a little bit of um, reflective code here, um, GC kernel. So this just walks up the context chain to find the, the implementer of process, what I just called, and then it just resumes from there. So that's how you can, even if you're down there somewhere, you can make it appear as if you're returning from this method. And you can pass the, the return value, and so it's transparent to the, to the runtime. So, but in, in the language nine, you have returns, explicit returns, or is no? no is that, that, that's not. That's only an implementation detail um, of the uh, of the runtime. So the, uh, the kernel language doesn't really have a return, but it has an abort. Uh, so that's what I try to show it here. Uh, let's see. Well, um, where would we have to? End? Uh, I guess we can do core. Yes, here. Um, so this this double arrow means do not uh, continue evaluating this kernel, but replace myself with a different kernel. That's a process switch, but what I call a process switch. Um, so because there can there are actually some kernels I. Quite just not sure uh, which ones that do some computation 
before and after. Um, well, actually, I know it's this stroking that looks really weird. Um, so in here.
So one two or three minutes. To one for one problem uh, in the bindings is uh, that if I construct these pipelines by several primitive calls, um, by the time I do the final rendering call that just executes the pipeline, my bitmaps might have shifted in the object memory. And so uh, one way would be to allocate these bitmaps outside the object memory. There is no pinning down of objects in the squeak object memory, so you cannot use that, that would be helpful. Um, but so my approach is that I have a single rendering primitive that gets fed a full specification for the pipeline. So um, the way that that looks, I can show you. Uh, so it's a that just 
yeah, interleaves the data. So we have a single stream, but there's uh, like the it's hard to define. Um, so it it puts one data item and the other, and then the one and the other, and one and the other, and then the next kernel could just work on every second item, so it passes the rest through. Um, so there are several versions of the runtime and we settled on that one. There, there, previously there was another one where you actually could have multiple outputs uh, and inputs, but that made the, the language harder. And essentially you couldn't specify those kernels in the language, so you had some kernels, primitive kernels that were written outside the language um, that had this feature of combining multiple streams and uh, splitting them, and so we got rid of it. Thank you, Bert. All right.